This morning's scripture comes from 1 Peter chapter 3. Finally, all of you have unity of spirit, sympathy, love for one another, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse, but on the contrary, repay with a blessing. It is for this that you are called, that you might inherit a blessing. For those who desire life and desire to see good days, let them keep their tongues from evil and their lips from speaking deceit. Let them turn away from evil and do good. Let them seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your heart, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You know, the world is an interesting place. When... Portland, Oregon, and Seattle are at 115 degrees in a heat wave. So I don't know exactly what that means or what message is being sent to us. I thought it was really hot down here, and then I got a word from a friend of mine who I know lives in Portland said it's going to be 115, and I thought, good Lord, 60%, did you know that 60% of people's homes in Seattle do not have air conditioning? Did you know that? Well, now you know. And I'm Paul Harvey, and this is the rest of the story. you got to be real old to get that reference. Yeah. You know, other things that are interesting that are going on in the world, that over the past couple of weeks, um, there have been some interesting things happening within our family of Christians. Um, the Southern Baptist Convention met, and there was a big sort of division and brouhaha about what direction would the denomination go. And it was a lot around uh, certain people feeling that the Southern Baptist de- denomination was drifting towards liberalism. Everything's in context, mind you, right? And I called my brother, who's a Southern Baptist uh, minister, and I said, uh, Tell me what's going on in the Southern Baptist Church. He said, well, John, he goes, go find the most conservative person in your church. He goes, that's the middle of the road Baptists. He goes, everybody else that wants things to change, they're farther right than that. So everything is contextual. And, and they went through and they came through. Uh, but what, 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 I, what I observed and what I shared with my brother is not the content or the truth of what it was they were arguing, whether it was about race or, or direction or seminaries or all these sorts of things. I was more attuned to the ways that Baptists were interacting with one another, the ways they were dialoguing about their differences, the ways that Christian were mo- Christians were modeling for us how we disagree, we don't agree with things. Now, it's not just Baptists, you know, we have our own difficulties as Methodists, but also in, in recent days you saw Roman Catholics dealing with some issues around the Eucharist and whether or not the Eucharist should be given to certain politicians who subscribe or support abortion. I'm not an abortion supporter, but I understand that the Catholics also were going through disagreements and arguments and fighting. And it wasn't so much the content, again, of what it was that they were talking about. I was looking at how it is that they engage in the dialogue. How do they have Christian conferencing together when they disagree? How do they model their faith in the midst of persecution or difficulty or conflict or disagreement. That, that to me, 
if you listen to anything that I say on a regular basis, becomes a very important part of what it means to be Christian. It's not so much what you know, it's how you live. Sometimes we, we get confused in our, our Western uh, American sensibilities that it's more important about what you know, that you know the truth rather than the pragmatic way you live. You know, for us in the Western world, what we call that in theology is we're more concerned with orthodoxy, which is the right belief, not so much on orthopraxy, which is right practice. This is why um, over the last month or so in this next month, I'm spending time in 1 Peter. While I think 1 Corinthians is a great book that helps us to think about being the church when we have a lot of division in-house, 1 Peter is a great book when we think about the church standing in the midst of a world or a culture that is persecuting the church, that is seeking to to undermine or disassemble or, or, or deteriorate the core and the key beliefs or teachings of what it means to be a follower of Christ. First Peter is a book that is written to Christians who are dealing with great persecution. They're dealing with great persecution originally up until the time of Paul and as Christianity grows, uh, the, 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 Christ, the, the persecution really comes more from the communities The communities where Christians are now beginning to to flourish and grow and expand. And they're being persecuted or pushed aside or belittled or made fun of by people in their communities who have different beliefs or different religious practice. But in about 80 AD, when Nero is gone, there's a new emperor that comes in named Domitian. Domitian is a very different emperor. Nero's persecution of the Christians was harsh, uh, was deadly, was violent, but it was pretty much secluded to Rome, which, by the way, Peter refers to as Babylon in his epistle as he says, I'm writing to you from Babylon. He's talking about Rome. And when Domitian comes in, there's an escalation because Domitian believes that the emperors of Rome are fully divine. And he lives into that and leverages that and forces, no matter what religion you are, that you acknowledge that he is a God. Well, you know, as Christians and Jews believe, we don't don't kneel to other gods. You remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in the fiery furnace, and they would not kneel, right, to another king who claimed to be God. And so the persecution now moves from local communities to now coming from the government itself. So Peter writes this epistle to a community that is under great struggle and persecution. He's writing to Christians who are really wrestling with living in the world. And we're not just talking about uh, like what we deal with, with maybe some of our our faith or our practices are are being belittled or looked down upon, or we feel as if we are besmirched because of our beliefs. We're talking about people who are being killed for their faith. Yes, being belittled and marginalized, but being killed for their faith. We're talking about a great deal of persecution. Peter opens this epistle of his, and just to give you a little sense of background, um, you know, Peter and Paul had some disagreements. Paul went into the Uh, the Asia Minor and across what is Turkey and Asia Minor and then into Greece and then into Rome and he planted these churches and he reached out to the Gentiles and he believed that it was faith alone. You didn't have to be circumcised and become a Jew in order to become a Christian. They sorted all that out in Acts and Peter, uh, Peter gave to Paul that even though Peter was being uh, pressured by the, the, the disciples who were in Jerusalem that said, no, the Christians have to become Jewish first because Christianity comes out of Judaism. And Peter said, no, 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 Paul's right. And late in his life, after Paul had already been in Rome and been in prison, the story or the legend is that Peter decided to follow the route of Paul and to go visit every church that Paul had established 
Now think about this. Think about that you're in a church in, say, Galatia, and all of a sudden Peter shows up. And you've heard the stories of Jesus and the disciples and the apostles, and you've heard Peter walked on water and the net and the fish, and all these stories have been told to you, and he shows up, old man Peter. He follows Paul around to each of these churches to reaffirm the message that Paul gave them and to say, this is the gospel. Hold fast, hold tight, even though you're under great persecution. And Peter ends up all the way in Rome. Legend has it that he was imprisoned outside of Rome. There's a church there now that you can visit called Peter and Paul in Chains. And the legend is that Peter was never able to get all the way into Rome. He was never able to see Paul. He was imprisoned outside and ultimately crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified in the way that his Lord and Savior had been crucified. All that to be said that Peter had a heart for the people of Christ. And so in the opening words of 1 Peter, the opening lines, he says, I want you all, now he goes, uh, blessed be, this is 1 Peter 1, 3 and 9, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us, listen to this, a new birth. He's given us a new birth into a living hope. A living hope that comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. This is an inheritance that is imperishable. It is undefiled, filed, unfading, kept in heaven for you. An inheritance that is imperishable, protected by the power of God through faith for salvation. This is what you rejoice in, even if now you have to wait and suffer various trials. The genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, though perishable, is tested now by fire. It may be found, your faith, to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. An inheritance that is imperishable. There's really no such thing. I mean, think about all of the things that you can leave someone. Uh, they're all temporal. And it, it doesn't have to be wealth. There's a, there's a, a story that's told by um, Goethe Weissman Klein, who lived through the Holocaust. And in one of the Holocaust museums in Boston, there is a memorial that you can walk through, and it tells the story of Goethe Klein, who says that in the concentration camp, there was a girl, a young girl named Ilsa, that was a friend of hers. And she found one day in the camp a raspberry. And she took the raspberry and she carried it with her all day long until she saw Gerda, her friend, and at the end of the day, she gave her the one single raspberry. And Gerda Klein says, the next day, Ilsa was taken to gas chambers. I mean, you think about that gift, that inheritance, it's far greater than any amount of money. How powerful that is, but even the raspberry is temporal, it's limited, it's not imperishable. Or then you can say something ludicrous like, uh, what was her name, um, Leona Helmsley, who died and left $12 million to her dog, a Maltese uh, dog, $12 million. But even that, as ludicrous and crazy as that is, and some inheritance, I mean, it, it's gone. The dog can't outlive $12 million. I wouldn't think the dog could outlive $12 million. I don't know. But even that seems ludicrous on its face. All gifts, all inheritance lacks permanence. You can build and amass any kind of fortune you want and leave it to your generations, but it still lacks permanence. There's no permanent value to it. All things, all gifts wither and fade like grass and flowers, as prophet Isaiah said. So what is an imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, as Peter says, inheritance? Peter says clearly that it is a living hope. A living hope that is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here, here's, here's what transforms us and allows us to live into this passage of Scripture today. New birth into a living hope, a gift and an inheritance that never withers, that never dies, that never goes away, a living hope where we experience 
joy, where we have the capacity to be grounded in something greater than ourselves, where we have the capacity to act and speak and react and interact with one another in a way that is counter to the world, even under great persecution, even when our truth and our facts are assaulted, we can stand with joy and hope and faith, this living hope rooted. Why? Rooted in the resurrection of Christ. See, the problem is too many Christians nowadays don't have anything rooted in living hope. It's all rooted in a hopeful optimism. And optimism and hope are not the same things. Optimism is limited because optimism is always circumstantial. When things are going well, you're optimistic. I'm optimistic right now because the pandemic seems to be going away. And then I watch the news, they go, well, there's more variants coming. And I'm like, ooh, I'm not so optimistic now anymore. Because it's rooted in circumstances. Does that make sense? And so if it's circumstantial, if it's circumstantial, then it's not imperishable. It's perishable. If the circumstances change for the better, optimism is rewarded. If circumstances don't change or turn out worse, what do you do then? What happens to the state of your being? What happens to your attitude? What happens to the way that you love or experience joy or goodness or kindness? Optimism can shatter or at least challenge our understandings of God. If we're only rooted in optimism and things change, we begin to doubt that God can do what God says God can do. And then you lose any sense of hope or joy or happiness or goodness. A living hope is what Peter lifts up. He says it's impervious to circumstances because it is rooted in the resurrection of Christ, his triumph over death. Hope lives because it's based in the resurrection of Jesus. Nothing can overcome that. Hope lives because of the, in the face of trial and suffering because of the resurrection of Jesus. This is why I have hope no matter how bad the world gets, no matter how bad politics gets, no matter how bad struggles around race get, no matter how bad issues uh, that, that seek to divide us and pull us apart, it doesn't matter how bad it gets, I still have hope. You know why? Because hope is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is imperishable, undefiled, eternal. As I've shared with you many times, Christians have lived... For 2,000 years under democracies, autocracies, fascist regimes, empires, theocracies, oligarch, everything. We've lived under every kind of government there is. And so to think, you know, we get a little spoiled sometimes because we live in such a wonderful country where we have the capacity to speak up and to vote and to help uh, align policies elect politicians who hopefully will represent those for us. We, we, we're fortunate in that sense. But don't, don't be led, don't be deceived to think that somehow our faith, our, our faith, our inheritance, our hope is somehow rooted in politics or in courts or in legislature or presidents. Those things are temporal and pass away. And I promise you, you'll learn if you haven't already you can vote for the person that you think is going to do everything the way you want. And they get in office and they do different things. It's funny. Politicians don't always tell the truth. So why? Why is this important? To have this living hope that is impervious to circumstances, rooted in Jesus Christ. Listen to this. This is important. Listen to this passage again that Joseph read. And I want to read it again. Because this is a passage that Peter is writing three chapters in. Now think about this. He's writing this under great persecution. He talks in, in, in verse, chapters 1 and 2 about steadfastness and perseverance under the persecution. In chapters 2, in the beginning of 3, he talks about the practical duties of a holy life. In chapters 3 and 4, he begins to lay out the example of Christ and the other motives uh, of patience and holiness in our lives under persecution. And in chapter 5, he concludes and he counsels to pastors and people how you live in this world, how you practice when you're under this great persecution. Listen to 1 Peter 3 again. 
writing to people who are being killed, persecuted by their neighborhoods, their communities, their states, their government, the empire itself. Listen to what he says. All of you, my brothers and sisters, be like-minded. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with an insult. On the contrary, repay evil with a blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear the threats. Do not be frightened. But always in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Listen to this. This is very important, brothers and sisters. He says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. He doesn't say, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for your truth. Doesn't say that. He's not concerned about your truth under persecution. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks for the hope you have. Are we tracking? You want to you know what it's like when we're called to be Christian under persecution and division, when we struggle, when we disagree? Peter tells us. And the struggles and the divisions these Christians were dealing with are far worse than what we deal with now. Psalm 39, 7 says, where do I put my hope? Only in you, O Lord. Psalm 62, 5 says, my soul waits in silence. Why? Because my hope is in the Lord. Peter says, in this living hope we rejoice, an indescribable and glorious joy with the suffering of various trials. Joy and suffering go together in genuine faith. Joy need not arise from the neatness of life when all is running smoothly. Peter says joy comes from the hope that we have rooted in the resurrection of Christ, even in the most difficult moments of life when we are persecuted for our faith. You know, I preach this message today and it's been on my heart because I hear a lot, whether it's my Catholic brothers and sisters, my Baptist brothers and sisters, my Methodist brothers and sisters, and I hear so much from Christians, our brothers and sisters, of how much we are being persecuted in these days. And my message to us all is the message from the gospel and is the message from Peter. If all we do is focus on those who are persecuting us and we don't focus on our way of living in persecution then we're going to get it all wrong for us the hope comes when we live within persecution and then will we model first peter 3 peter telling people who are being Murdered, killed, fired from their jobs, for their faith, run out of town, imprisoned, beaten, love one another. Do not repay evil with evil. But remember the imperishable inheritance that you have. No fire, no whip, no prison will ever be able to take that away because it's rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The last thing I'll lift up is Stanley, years ago, Stanley Harawas and Will Willimon wrote a book called Resonant Aliens. 
And Stanley uh, Harawas and, and Will Willimon wrote it towards the end of the book. It said, Christianity is more than a matter of new understanding. Christianity is an invitation to be a part of an alien people who make a difference in the world because they see something that cannot otherwise be seen without Jesus Christ. Right living is way harder than right thinking. The challenge is not the intellectual, but the political one. And when he means political here, not politics like we think politics, he means organizational act capacity. He says the political aspect that we have to do is not thinking, but how do we organize ourselves? We organize ourselves as the creation of a new people who have aligned themselves with a seismic shift that has occurred in the world since Christ. The church, he said, must continually challenge worldly assumptions and show what a marvelous opportunity awaits all of us who sense this adventure as the church in the world. People who, yes, reside here and now, but live here as aliens in a foreign land. People who know that, that while we live here, our commonwealth is in heaven, our loyalty is in heaven to God. And it doesn't mean that we live like some fire insurance faith where we just get saved and then we just check out. The way we change the world is not our activism as much as it is our lives. I see this modeled in Jesus. I see it modeled in the teachings of Paul. And you see and hear now modeled in the life and the teachings of Peter to a persecuted community where he says to them again, be like-minded, sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with a blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. We have been given a new birth, he says in chapter 1, into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. world's not an easy place to live in these days. Amen? It's tough. I get it. And I think the more difficult it gets, the more divisive the world gets, the harder it is for us to live in the world, the more we have to be faithful to the teachings of this book. And the more you're going to hear me preaching from the elements and the teachings of this book. Because what they're going to do is they're not good. This book is not going to take your side. It's not going to take a side. What it's going to do is it's going to shine a light on your soul. And it's going to ask you to take a deep, hard look. How you live. How you speak. How you love. How you humble yourself. And how you live your life. Every day in the midst of a chaotic, tumultuous world that's ready to persecute the faith at the drop of a hat. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we would uh, work hard in our spiritual lives to read once again the epistle of 1 Peter. To hear the encouragement that you give to a church that is persecuted a church that is marginalized, a church that has no power or resource and seems to daily be attacked. And yet the words of Peter point to something far greater and deeper for us to put our trust and reliance in. But he also calls us to live a certain way, to respond to persecution in a certain way, to make sure that we always love just echoing once again the teachings of Jesus, the life of Jesus who laid his life down for the world, who has persecuted himself and yet willingly gave himself to that for us all. What a great model for us to think about in these days we find ourselves. For love will win in the end Love will win in the end, not force, not might, not sword, 
And I pray that we will all hear and see that and be transformed by it in our prayer life, in our devotional life, in our church attendance life, in our community life. In the name of Christ we pray, amen.